So for the past year or so, I've been reviewing horror games of all shapes and sizes. Some games involve Resident Evil-like gameplay where instead of fighting zombies, you fight killer muppets. Other games can be about trying to use a train to kill a much larger haunted train. But there's one game that I always go back to and play for hours on end just because the gameplay was always so engaging, that being Project Zomboid. Created by the small development team known as the Indie Stone, Project Zomboid has been around since 2013, over 10 years ago as of recording this. Since the release, there has been countless amounts of updates and builds that made this game as unique as it is currently. Within the current build of Project Zomboid, there are hundreds of hours worth of content that you can explore while trying to survive the endless amounts of undead that try to rip you from limb to limb. It is truly an amazing game. But it kinda sucks though, is because of this game's popularity most likely never reaching its full potential due to Zomboid's hit or miss isometric art style. Combined with the incredibly large difficulty spike, most people who do end up playing this game won't encounter a fraction of what's all in here. Not to mention, with the new Build 42 update that's set to be released at literally any moment at this point, there'll probably be even more content to explore. And so because of that, I wanted to make not just any old lore video about Project Zomboid, but a full-on, totally 100% original iceberg video on the game. Some of you watching this video might know what an iceberg video is, but for those of you who do not, an iceberg is this thing right here. You know, the thing that bits the titanic? Yeah, that. In an iceberg, there's usually around eight different layers to explore, starting at the very tippy top and going down. At the top of the iceberg, I'll discuss some pretty common knowledge about the game if you've ever played it, but the further down I'll go, I'll talk more about some missing or removed features, hidden lore or theories, or really anything that isn't widely known per se. Before I get into this video, I do want to give a quick shout out to Reddit user Ash Jester for the iceberg. I did use their iceberg to get a good basis point to create my video, and because it is a little bit old, I think it's about three years old right now, there are some items that I either added myself or removed, and for looking up most of the information that I didn't know about, I used Project Zomboid's wiki, which a huge shout out to that site, it helped me out tremendously. But other than that, as you can tell from this video's runtime, I have a lot to cover. So with that said, sit back, relax, and let's get into the ultimate Project Zomboid iceberg. To start things off, when you enter the game, you have- Whoa, buddy! I know it's the apocalypse and everybody's walking corpses, but show some common decency and put on something. But what is something easy to find and good to wear against the zombies? Well, why don't you try out the firefighter outfit? These are very common clothes that you can find in some firefighter pickup trucks, firefighter zombies, or even at the firehouse in Rosewood and Louisville. To this day, this article of clothing is arguably the best clothes to find, as although it will provide a massive amount of protection against bites and scratches, the clothes are pretty heavy, which affects both your movement and your attack speed, as well as the clothes can get very hot during the summertime. If you're asking me though, I think you should go with these clothes, as you'll look completely badass while doing this. Catching fires on zombies is one of, if not the best ways to take on hundreds of zombies at a time. There are a couple of easy ways to set something ablaze. You can either leave food or metal in an oven or a microwave. You can cause an explosion of some sort, but the most effective way is without a doubt using a Molotov. Using either a gas bottle or a bottle of bourbon and a rag to make this throwable item, once you have a horde grouped up, igniting the zombies will easily burn hundreds in maybe about a day or so. As long as you know how to train against a large group of zombies, you'll most likely be fine. But make sure when you are doing this, to do this on a road or a parking lot or really anything that won't catch fire, trust me, it's happened more times than I can admit. After catching these zombies on fire, you might want to take a small break to catch your breath. Idling not only lets you recover some stamina, but your character can also have some pretty cool animations while doing absolutely nothing. As your character is holding certain items while you are AFK, they can have some special animations looking at what they have. Or if you have my luck, the only animation they will do is die from starvation or something. Now one way to die without having to idle for so long though, is by pressing one button, Q. This button is feared throughout the entire Project Zomboid community as just pressing the button once, just one little bit of a tap, this little thing will cause your character to scream at the very top of their lungs, causing all nearby zombies to come at you like moths to a flame. Oh, you meant to press W, you stupid dumb idiot? Oh, have fun trying to take on the massive amounts of zombies banging at your door. Usually, screaming outside won't be as risky as if you were inside a dark, cramped room, but nevertheless, 
less, accidentally pressing Q or lying to your friends about what the button can do can be extremely lethal. Now, what's interesting about your character yelling is if you were to crouch beforehand, you'll instead give a very quiet whisper. This can be very useful if you were planning on taking out a few stragglers in a large group, but make sure you are actually crouching. The next build for Zomboid is set to be released sometime soon? Maybe? There's no real release date, we've all just been patiently waiting for a couple years at this point. Now, Build 42 is meant to overhaul the gameplay completely, where now there will be introductions of basements and underground areas, blacksmithing to forge weapons and other items, actually hunting real animals that you can see with your own two eyes, and most importantly, the reintroduction of a lost feature. That being, NPCs in the current Build 41 of Zomboid are nowhere to be seen, but are expected to make a return come the next major update. These NPCs are stated by the devs to be either neutral or hostile to the player and can be in large groups. I say return as NPCs were actually in the very early stages of Zomboid, but they were scrapped as they became more and more buggy the more updates rolled out. If you are impatient and you do want NPCs now in your game, go ahead and download Superb Survivors off the Steam Workshop. Even though you cannot find people in Nox Country, this doesn't mean people cannot find you. At least one time per world that you play in, a helicopter will spawn in at a random time to fly over Knox Country. Although the thought of help could be seen as a lifesaver, I mean it's a helicopter for God's sake, the vehicle doesn't actually do anything other than fly near you if you're spotted by it and attract hundreds if not thousands of zombies near your location. Now you can hide in a forest or in a house without windows to make the helicopter leave, but maybe that helicopter actually had Frank West and he was just trying to get a good scoop. He's covered wars you know. If there's one thing you'll need most when scavenging, it's a bag. Depending on what type of bag you have, you're able to hold it in your offhand or in your back, and it will let you hold many more items before you start to feel over encumbered and lose speed and stamina. Out of all 31 bags that are in the game, the two very best ones are without a doubt the large backpack and the military backpack, as respectively the two reduce item encumbrance by 85-87%, to 87%, they lower overall speed by only 6%, and they have a capacity of 27-28 to 28 pounds. Now if you're wondering what the best offhand bag is, well, don't worry about them, they all kind of suck. Most bags that you can wear are only one at a time, except for the fanny packs. You're actually able to wear them while wearing another bag on your back, and on top of that, you can wear one on your front and back. People say that fanny packs are useless because of the capacity only being two pounds, but really, it can be an amazing storage space to hold smaller items like ammo or medicine. So during your time in Knox Country, you can come across two of the hardest buildings you could ever enter, the mall. These malls can be a little tricky to find within Zomboid, as both the Crossroads Mall and the Grand Ohio Mall are located just outside or in the heart of Louisville, respectively, and even though it has numerous amounts of stores to find that has really good loot to the point where you could easily live here and not have to scavenge anywhere else, and also one of them has a really cool mall court train, this is also a major nesting ground for zombies. But as long as you bring your trusty yellow jacket for protection, and maybe even craft a spiked baseball bat to bash the undead brains in, you'll be fine. Now like I said, finding these malls within Project Zomboid can be fairly difficult. I can assure you that without using your map, it will most likely be like finding a needle in a haystack. And what's worse is that there are no readable maps that'll show this location among many other unique places. What do you do then? Well, a fan by the name of Ben Scheider decided to make a full-scale map of Knox Country titled Project Zomboid Map Project, so you can discover just about everything that is within this location. This map project not only shows the exact coordinates of whatever area you're looking at, but it can also include include certain modded maps like Bedford Falls as well as some other vanilla maps. Speaking of which, if you ever get tired of the traditional vanilla settings in Knox Country, Kentucky, you have two different options to do. One, you can mod your entire heart out with the Steam Workshop. If you wanted to, put on that shit your pants mod. But if you don't feel like modding, you can also try out the different challenge modes within the single player. Added during the Build 41 update, the Indie Stone introduces a variety of different challenges and even new maps so you can see if you can survive in what could be the worst start ever. These challenges are a really CDDA. Named after another really fun zombie survival game, Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead, this is one of, if not the hardest starts for the game, as you'll spawn in a burning building wearing nothing but underwear and a few cuts you earn from falling out of a shower, and you're also drunk and sick, so have fun, don't die. There's a storm is coming. For the first day of survival, you'll see that the sun starts to fade away, and for the next coming days until you die,
sky, a storm will rage on, making it very hard to see what's even two feet in front of you. You also have House in the Woods Last Stand in the Accumulator version. The small map has you in a cabin in the woods trying to fend off an unlimited amount of zombies. In the original mode, you'll have only limited amount of items and have to see how far you can get from there. But with Accumulator, you'll be given money after every kill or after every round, so that way you can buy new weapons, repair any equipment, and essentially do anything you wanted in like Call of Duty Zombies, for example. After that is the Descending Fog. This mode acts similarly to the Endless Storm mode, where on the first day, everything seems to be sunny enough, but as the days go on, more and more fog will show up as if this is the start of Stephen King's The Mist. Ah! Winter is Coming is the next never-ending thing. For the first three days of surviving, you will have some pretty sunny weather, but after that, it is the onslaught of snow. And to end off this little circle of never-ending things, there's now never-ending zombie hordes. You'll have 24 hours to loot as much as you can within the old Knox County until tens of thousands of zombies will seemingly pop up out of nowhere. Onto the new maps, there's King's Mouth. This completely new map is a fictional resort that's based off the Caribbean. If you ever wanted a nice suntown while also bashing some zombie brains in, well, you're gonna be having some fun here. Another new map area is called the Studio, where you can roam and do whatever you want in this studio. Fun fact about this place, though, the studio is based off the Warner Bros. studio lot in Burbank, California, so shout out to Burbank. Finally, you have this game mode, where you'll spawn into the Knox Country Mall 20 minutes before it opens and have to survive an endless amount of zombies trying to break in and get the greatest Black Friday sale ever. It's kind of like the House in the Woods challenge, just a lot bigger. Unfortunately, this game mode has been wiped off single player, so you cannot play it in vanilla. However, if you are still interested in playing it, you can download the Return of the Opening Hours challenge off of the Steam Workshop. Okay, Dead Rising 3 reference time. Um, okay, no matter how hard you try to believe, you're not Nick Ramos, so don't try and get bit- Wait, hold on, the third game doesn't take place in a mall. Wait, no, ew, it was four! No, never mind, joke's over, on to the next tier. <laughs> I really thought that would work. Within the game settings of any world, you can affect how the zombies will act when they spot you. Some of these settings involve how easily they can find you, another setting has to do with their memory, hell, you can even change up their infection cause if you really wanted to. But one of the most terrifying settings is the ability to turn the zombies from just fast shamblers oh, look at the little slow zombie, oh, to full-on sprinters, oh my god, how do you even hit this thing? I can't even outrun, and now I'm dead. Another way zombies can move about is by crawling. Unlike sprinters, the crawlers happen naturally throughout the world and cannot be changed in the settings. To make a zombie crawl, you either have to hit it or have it jump over a small fence, in which there's a small chance that it just won't get up. Or if it wants to for some reason, it can decide to just get down on its fours and crawl underneath a car. Because if flesh-eating soulless zombies were not terrifying enough, they can now hide under cars to try to bite your little ankles. These crawlers are also a pain to hit, at least when I'm up against them. I don't know, usually they're one to two hits even if you stomp them in, but for some reason they move out of the way so easily, they're so hard to hit. Now a good way to take on these zombies no matter how fast they are is by using weapons. But what should you use? One of the biggest conflicts of the century is the debate on whether the crowbar is better than the axe and vice versa. The people who side with the crowbar argue that even though the crowbar initially has a low damage output, the durability of the weapon is so huge and once you level up the long blunt skill, you will not have a problem against the zombies. But axe people believe that the axe is superior due to its ability to actually repair the weapon upon breakage unlike the crowbar, has a very high damage output off the bat, and can also chop down trees to build up barricades and other stuff. But if you ask me, I'm ride or die with that crowbar. Apart from that debate, another really useful weapon that people use in the debate is a katana. Katanas are one of the best melee weapons in Zomboid hands down. This sword can have very high durability and can shred through these zombies like one of those glowing red knife videos on YouTube. The problem with them though is that katanas are rare, and I really mean rare. You can find most of these weapons in a pawn shop or a gun store from time to time. However, if you are really lucky, you can find them lodged in a roaming zombie after about 30 days of surviving. But if you are able to retrieve one that way, they tend to break fairly quickly due to its low durability. Once you find a car in the world, you have the ability to hitch it to other cars and trailers. This can help if you are looking to move to another town 
phone or if you wanted to create a sort of barricade to keep you safe. But just like in real life, make sure that you're using a vehicle that can actually hitch other cars. Because if you're using a little shitty sedan to hitch a trailer, you're gonna go absolutely nowhere while losing every bit of gas you collected. I did say that you can use vehicles to barricade yourself and that is true. One way to barricade up your base to protect yourself from zombies is by entrapping yourself with different amount of cars. However, just as I stated in the crawler section, the zombies can go underneath the cars and get through your DIY wall. The best use of a vehicle barricade, in my opinion, is by blocking up doors and windows, which breaks the zombies' pathfinding. But another really good substitution also is the use of natural fences found around the world as they're unbreakable and vanilla, or you can build a small fence backed up by a crate and then backed up by another small fence, which doesn't allow the zombies to climb over or break. After you kill a zombie or loot a house, you have a very small chance of finding an annotated map. Just like a regular map, annotated maps will reveal an entire town, so that way you don't have to look everywhere to review all the buildings near you. However, these maps will also leave markings indicating where a survivor was held up, or even where they met their untimely death. On top of each marked house having either really good loot or really dangerous amounts of zombies, it's very interesting reading how everyone else treated the apocalypse, especially since right now you cannot find anyone. But what sucks about these maps is that every single one of them stacks as annotated maps, so you don't really know which town you're looking at until you read it. So have fun trying to sift through all the different maps. Just west of the spawnable town of Rosewood, you can find a trail that beads off the main highway. Following the trail can be pretty dangerous as zombies love to camp out here, but coming towards the end of the trail brings you to a Knox Country military base. This is a very secretive base as it cannot be found on any of the maps that you read and can only be discovered by either just stumbling upon it or using the Project Zomboid map project that I mentioned earlier. Upon entering the base, you can find that there is a laboratory of some sort that doesn't have a full explanation of what's being studied here, but there is a VHS tape partially discussing the lab that I'll cover a little bit later on. Although the lab itself looks very bare bones, as it looks like a simple office with desks and lab equipment here and there, what's really strange is the broken down elevator that supposedly only goes down as there's no shaft on the very small second floor. Maybe we'll get more lore about this place once Build 42 releases. According to the iceberg, every single road on the Project Zomboid map turns in 90 degrees no matter how sharp the turn really is. There are turns that can be very sharp and then there can be some that are very wide, but 9 times out of 10 they will be 90 degrees. I say that as some back roads have very few twists and turns that aren't 90 degrees, but for the most part though, because the game is isometric, most turns that you are going to make are going to be in a right angle, so navigation around Knox Country will be fairly manageable. God, how many times did I say turn in this segment? Oh shit, turn bitch, turn! Every Thursday, the Indie Stone releases a blog discussing the future of Zomboid and how development for the game is going. Seeing development updates for a game made over 10 years ago is pretty unheard of, but for them to do it every single week just shows how committed the developers are to making such an amazing game. Also, this is just a side note, but their Twitter page is filled with nothing but kindness from whoever runs it, so go follow them if you haven't already. Alright, wholesome content over, time to drink bleach. You can find bleach throughout the world that you can use with a mop to clean up blood stains on your base. But if you're feeling a little frisky, a little quirky if you want to put it, uh, you, you could just gulp the entire bottle down which will always kill you. Sometimes you can even find dead survivors in some houses who paint the picture that they themselves drank the bleach so they didn't have to become a zombie. But fuck those survivors, they're not even surviving at this point. But you know who still is surviving? Your friends. You know you want to mix some bleach into their chicken noodle soup, so just go ahead and do it. Do it. Do it. Do you guys remember the outbreak that occurred in 2020 that I cannot specifically name because I really do not want this video to be demonetized? Remember how for some reason everybody went ape shit over toilet paper to the point where people were hoarding and fighting over it like it was a potato in 1845 Ireland? Well, there's an incredibly rare chance for one of the houses you break into to actually have dozens of toilet paper to make fun of that entire situation. How rare is this easter egg you ask? Well, I have over 300 hours in the game and I have not once come across this ever before. Another very rare easter egg you can find in Knox Country is Project Zomboid's mascot Spiffo. If you go near one of the Spiffo restaurants that are found in just about every single town in Knox Country, you have a chance of finding a zombie wearing a full Spiffo costume. Even though this costume has no scratch or bite resistance, it does have at least a resistance to both cold and rainy weather. Also, 
it's a Spiffo costume. That has to be one of the greatest things you can find in a game. Another Spiffo item you can find throughout the world is a plush of Spiffo himself. This item can be easier to find as it's found in children's rooms, toy stores, or Spiffo merch crates. There's also a big Spiffo plush that you can find somehow. However, it's far rarer to find this version, but for some reason you can find it while foraging throughout the world. There are also some other plushies that you can find in Nox Country if you wanted to start a little collection before the zombies rip your flesh off. Like this character that you can find in the world, Pancake the Hedgehog. Sounds like a shitty Sonic the Hedgehog fan character. On top of that, Terraria also includes the Spiffo plush that you can find from zombies at about a 1 in 1,500 chance. And that's why Terraria is the absolute GOAT. This modern map called Bedford Falls is created by Ringgod123 and it offers a new town to spawn in. This map is a couple years old and I did mention that this is one of the maps that you can use with the Project Zomboid Project map. But I gotta be honest man, this town is quite impressive to wander through. Really. Bedford Falls is like a mini Louisville, the late stage city that you can enter after passing through the quarantine fence. This is just a cool mod that you should consider downloading. Another very cool mod called the Only Cure is something that I would definitely install if you ever wanted to play modded Zomboid. Created by Mr. Bounty, this mod lets you take the only way out of becoming a zombie by hacking off the limb that was bitten. Or if you're just a raging psycho, you can cut everything off and become the first potato zombie. Have fun with that. While trying to survive in Nox Country, you can on occasion hear different things going on in the world. Some of them is a dog barking or howling, a person screaming as if they're being eaten alive, or even gunshots from another survivor. These what you call meta events sadly have nothing to them yet as there's no NPCs or animals in this build 41. However, this won't stop zombies from moving towards that general area, so it's best to hide away if you hear that going on. So, this is kind of embarrassing to admit, but for the entire time I've been playing this game, I've always thought that the land that you survive in was called Knox County. It is not that. It used to be called Knox County during the older stages of the game, with the map even being completely different as you saw with the You Have One Day Challenge. But it was eventually changed to the Knox Country we know and love today. But I kind of like calling the former better, I don't really know why they changed the name itself. On the topic of older stuff in the game, one of the only named survivors within Project Zombie is the two survivors named Bob and Kate. You cannot find these characters in the actual game itself anymore, but they are the two people that you see within the main menu screen, as well as it's theorized that the person standing on top of the car in the game's cover is Bob himself due to the famous bald spot on top of his head. I did say that Bob and Kate are no longer in the game anymore, and that's because they were featured in the very old tutorial called Till Death Do Us Part in the very early builds of the game back when all the sprites were 2D pixels. Crazily enough, this tutorial can actually be considered as a story mode for the game, as you're tasked with trying to hunker down and protect Kate after she broke her leg due to some scavenging. While you're trying to protect Kate, an NPC survivor will come in trying to rob you and steal every single supply that you have, so you have to deal with him as well. But because of the NPCs being scrapped in the early stages of the game, in 2013 the tutorial was fully removed alongside those buggy NPCs, and to this day we still have this tutorial that sadly has no real story and no mention of a Bob or Kate. It is nice to know that the two is recognized in the later stages of the game, and it is pretty sweet to have the two holding together in a loving embrace in the title screen of the game. Anyways, with that said, let's just head on to the next tier of the iceberg. What? No, but no, they were just hugging each other. No, come on, man. They, they are dead. There needs to be at least one semi-happy ending in Zomboid. Please, come on. <sighs> Fine, they're dead. In the menu screen, you can see the two in a dark barricaded room with Bob holding onto the injured Kate. At first, you would think that this is the wholesome picture as it's two survivors consoling themselves in what seems to be their last moment before zombies break down this weak barricade. However, every few seconds or so, lightning will strike in the background which illuminates the room and shows that Bob is actually gnawing on Kate's neck. He is a zombie? How or when he became a zombie is completely unknown as he was the playable character in the tutorial, but god damn man, that menu screen feels a lot more darker with this information. Rest in peace Bob and Kate, man. I, I really love their 
their broken leg and bald spot. Louisville is the late stage area that you can go to in Knox Country on the top right of the map. Top right in the sense that I'm using the top down perspective of the map. Fuck using the isometric perspective. Getting here is fairly difficult as you have to pass over a bridge filled with broken down cars, but if you're a good enough driver, you can just use the railroad bridge. Once you pass that though, you have miles to go before reaching a quarantine zone once operated by the military, but was eventually overrun. Passing through that by breaking down some gates, you have a few more miles to travel before you can actually reach the big city. But even if you somehow make it over there alive, it is going to be absolute hell trying to stay there and make an actual base, as there are thousands of zombies just residing here and roaming the streets. Actually, it's not just the streets, there are dozens of zombies in each building. Louisville is the real definition of a high risk, high reward, so it's never a good idea to first come here when you have no loot. I mean, if you want to become a zombie, it's a really good strategy, I guess. So we all know that zombies are the biggest threat within Project Zomboid, right? Rip right? It is in fact trees and fences that are the silent killer for your character. Apart from if you hug a tree while going 80 miles per hour in a car, there's always a chance that walking past some woods or jumping over a fence can cause your character to fall and scratch themselves, with the chance increasing if you jog, and it of course increasing even more if you sprint. Failing to put any bandages on these scratches, especially on your neck or head, will cause your character to quickly bleed out and die. Imagine being in a zombie apocalypse where all your friends and family got savagely eaten by mindless zombies, and you somehow died to a tree. Couldn't be me, bro. Okay, yeah, it did happen to me once. Now, if killer trees didn't make you piss and shit yourself at the same time out of fear, well, then this might. The zombies within Project Zomboid can also kill you. I know, I know, shh, shh. It's okay, it's okay, I'm scared too. But it's common knowledge that if a zombie bites or scratches you, you most likely will die. But did you know that you can still end up dead against other dead zombies? Leaving corpses inside or even next to your base for a prolonged time can lead to your character getting sick and even dying. As the corpse rots, which you can always tell that's the case when flies are around the body, your character can have the chance of becoming queasy, with you of course getting worse the longer you stay in that area. The best way to prevent from getting sick is by burying the bodies, placing them far enough away away from the base where you wouldn't get sick, or if you're rather sick in the head, you can just up and burn the bodies. Just don't miss the shot. The Life and Living TV channel is the only station whose shows give XP. The Cook Show airs at 6 in the morning, and the show itself is very straight to the point and gives recipes to cook in-game items. At 6 in the evening, the manly man himself, Dean of Exposure Survival, will show you how to live out in the world. But at noon, Woodcraft comes on, and even though it gives you the valuable carpentry XP, the host is... how you say extremely horned up to all the ladies out in the world. Well, hey, y'all just caught me working out. Got a real sweat going on here. Next time, I'll shut the door. But hey, there's no door. Next time, Intermediary, part two. We find somewhere where you can rest that sweet behind. Chairs, don't miss it. I need me some sweet, unfresh zombie ass. Okay, yeah, I made that last one up. For this item, I was half tempted to scrap it, as in the previous build, it was pretty hard to find this item, but that's all fixed, and the poncho itself actually is not that great. But when looking at the Project Zomboid wiki on the poncho, the only thing that it says is that it protects from rain and it looks cool. So once again, I just want to make a quick thank you over to the people who work on the Project Zomboid wiki for supplying research, not even Illuminati naughty could find. So in Knox Country, you can spawn in one of four towns, that being West Point, Riverside, Rosewood, and the name I'll never be able to pronounce no matter how long I play this game. Most likely in your playthrough, you'll either live in that town the entire time, maybe move to another town, or end up at the ultimate city, Louisville. But within this part of Kentucky, there are a lot of cool points of interest that you can head on over to. One of them is what is seemingly a town that is completely abandoned. Well, I mean, all the towns are abandoned here, but... 
Like, it's been abandoned before the apocalypse. In this town, there's a factory nearby that doesn't seem like anyone has been there for quite some time. There aren't many zombies to find within the town itself, and every single house within here has been gutted or has caught fire before. That is, except for one house. Nicknamed the Trapper House, this place is home to a lot of useful traps that you can use if you want to try out the game's hunting mechanics. This is just one of many places that doesn't have a map, but is insanely cool to stop by at least once in your playthrough. Through. One of, if not the best cars within Project Zomboid, is the Franklin Value Line Van. This vehicle can come in many shapes and sizes, as some can be normal vans, ambulances, a spiffo van, a liquor van, and many more. Depending on the variant of the Value Line, it can have some very good traits. One of them is a six-seater, which is by far the most that people can fit in any vanilla vehicle. Others, like the ambulance, can have almost 500 horsepower, which is about as fast as any sport car. Since it's a van, it'll also have an incredible incredible amount of storage space, and if you're worried about hitting something, don't worry as these vans are incredibly durable, so this needs to be the ultimate car that you need to get as soon as possible. While traveling through the county of Knox Country, you may come across a certain easter egg that would excite Friday the 13th fans. On very rare occasions when looting any house, you have a chance of finding a Jason Voorhees zombies just roaming about. Not only does this Jason zombie have a really cool hockey mask that you can take to start your own camp time massacres, but it also has a machete ripe for the taking. Another cool easter egg that you may have spotted when looting, there's a very low chance that a house that you can enter can contain a few prisoner zombies wearing orange jumpsuits and duffel bags, almost as if they just escaped from the Rosewood prison and are ready to commit more crimes. What's interesting about this scenario is that there can be a few amount of police zombies in the same house as the prisoners. Maybe the prisoners broke out during the time of the apocalypse and were trying to get loot, but were caught and put down by the police, only for them to reanimate and to eat the police. Who knows? All I know is that that these easter eggs make looting houses so much more fun and engaging. A third really cool, but this time extremely deadly easter egg you can find in houses is a bathroom. But not just any bathroom. You see, when you're looting houses, there's always the possibility that a zombie is behind another room and is breaking down the door to get you. Now, usually there's about one or two zombies in this room, but even then, they can easily catch you off guard if you're not paying enough attention and take a major chomp out of you. Now, with some bathrooms, on the other hand, oh man, there's a chance that you can open a door and find over a dozen zombies all cramped up and ready to eat you. It is never a good idea to take on this horde and side as you'll have no room to maneuver, and like, trust me on that. No matter how confident you think you are at the combat within Project Zomboid, you are not going to survive over a dozen zombies in a little small house. But it's kinda weird that all these people were crammed into a bathroom right before the apocalypse were starting. What were they doing, exactly? Another really cool easter egg is something you might have seen already in your playthrough, and that is what can be on some zombies t-shirts. Now most times, you'll just come across a zombie with a regular t-shirt, they might have a shirt with a specific brand on it or a work t-shirt on. Hell, it might even be striped. But they're all just something that would be pretty normal to see in your day-to-day -day life. But sometimes, some t-shirts that the zombies can wear can have some really interesting decals. There's an I Heart Kentucky t-shirt as well as the flag of the United States. Because if there's one thing us Americans love more than the freedom of putting AR-15s on our tractors, it's the grand old US of A flag. You also have a t-shirt of a dog howling at the moon because that zombie just has that dog in them. And on some rare occasions, you can find the Indie Stone logo, which is just, you know, a really fun easter egg to see. But on really rare occasions, you can find the shirt of the face of Indie Stone developer Romaine Drawn, which is slightly disturbing if you zoom in very close in on that face. Now this next easter egg, oh my god, we are on a roll with these easter eggs. This one doesn't come directly from Zomboid itself, but from another goaded survival game, Minecraft. We all know about that text next to the title in the menu screen. It usually has some quirky text that you can read every time you log into the game. But did you know that Minecraft included a shout out to Project Zomboid? There's a very small chance that loading up Minecraft could include the also try Project Zomboid, which is just really cool to see. Minecraft is always so cool with shouting out other games. You gotta love Mojang for that. I would probably love Mojang more if they included something like, I don't know. Also try out Scrakes. Wait, how would you try me out? Never mind. on to the next level.
When making your way over to the prison just outside of Rosewood, you'll notice that there are a lot of zombies. Thousands to be exact. Of course, you have your typical prisoner and police zombies because this is a prison after all. But what's strange is that there will be a good amount of zombies wearing everyday clothes. You can even see some of them being locked away in prison cells as if someone put them there. Some people have theorized that the prison might have been an outpost for any survivors or maybe even a quarantine zone during the initial outbreak. But there aren't any military personnel, newly put in barricades, or even signs indicating that this is the case, which is a shame. I would love to see some large places act as a military outpost during the start of the outbreak. That would be pretty neat to explore. Speaking of military, going back to the secretive military base that is close to Rosewood, there seems to be some hidden conspiracy theories and lore that you can find within a few shows and specific calls. VHS tapes are a good way to watch pre-recorded TV shows or homemade films, but one titled CONSPIRACY CRAP questions why exactly the military base is here and why people seem to be going in and out of the base very early in the mornings. This tape also mentions a mass amount of livestock dying away, a foul taste in the tap water, and even a foul smell in the air, which occurred only a few days before the outbreak. We all know the US military lies about UFOs, the Philadelphia experiment, and the reasons for the new heart project, but did you know there's a secret laboratory right here in Kentucky for years? An area in the middle of the forest to the west of Rosewood has been marked on the maps as restricted area, accessible by only a series of purposely inconspicuous dirt roads, and the purpose of this facility is unknown. We do know that, for years, the Maldra area has been the subject of mysterious military testing. Mass livestock deaths, st strange taste from the faucet water, and the foul smells in the air have all been noticed locally. Just what is going on in that lab? Who are the mysterious personnel who travel to the lab in, in the early hours of the morning? Are there hidden underground facilities? A tunnel to Area 51? Headquarters for Majestic 12? We have no way of knowing, and the army will never tell the truth. And the mystery continues. Another piece of evidence against this military base is from an anonymous caller who calls into the Knox Talk radio. This janitor talks about how he used to work for the military base just cleaning up random parts of the building. But he did see some scientists were testing on what seems to be a handful of dogs and other animals for whatever reason. He then states that one of the security guards' dogs got sick supposedly because of the testing, which could be the patient zero of the outbreak. Although this call had a good bit of information that could tie to the reason of the outbreak, the Knox Talk host quickly hangs up from the caller as he believed that this was a prank all along. Even though these two pieces of information don't concretely spell out what exactly happened to start this outbreak, these are pretty good evidences to back up the claim that the government had some sort of inclusion to this outbreak. Well, generators are very useful items once power and water shut off between the first day and 30 days into the outbreak. This lets you turn on power in a short area so you can see, watch TV, or really do anything that requires power because it's a generator and you all probably knew what that was in the first place. To say that the generator will give you safety is far from correct. Over time, generators will lose both fuel and health the more things that you have powered on. Now, running out of fuel isn't a bad thing, as you can always find gas to refuel. However, you should always keep an eye on its health. If it reaches below 20% in condition, there's a chance for the generator to outright explode, which can either burn your base to the ground or even you. Generators are also pretty loud. They have a noise radius of around 20 tiles, meaning that zombies can hear them from quite a distance and be attracted to your base. So, should you put it in your base to prevent zombies from hearing it? No, of course not. Don't ever do that, as the fumes from the gasoline will collect inside of the building and will suffocate your character to death. I swear, this game can be too realistic at times, but that's why I love it. What's not realistic is the books in Project Zomboid. They can be a little bit weird, to say the least. To level up any of the skills, you have to practice it outright. So, for example, if you wanted to level up your carpentry, you would have to destroy and rebuild some chairs. Books, though, can increase the multiplier in which you get XP from doing certain tasks. While reading these books, you have the ability to lose stress, panic, boredom, and unhappiness. So what's the point of taking any bottles of antidepressants and whiskey if you can just read some fucking Captain Underpants or some shit, man? Houses can have either really amazing loot that'll help you survive the apocalypse for weeks on end, or it can maybe have three cans and, if you're lucky, a butter knife, depending on which house you go to. However, each house has a chance of having 
and loose floorboards that can hold really great loot. These hidden stashes can be detected by having a creaking sound when walking over it and can be looted just like how all other containers are. Inside these stashes, you can find pistols, shotguns, various tools, and for some reason, jewelry in case you wanted to get your fashion on. Speaking of fashion, one of the best protections against bullets or really anything to the chest is going to be your bulletproof vest. In Project Zomboid, there are three different types of vests. The police vest, the military vest, and the civilian vest. The first two are pretty self-explanatory on where to find. The police vest can be found on police officers or police property. Same with the military vest, except it's found on the military, but the civilian one is a little strange. They're most commonly found within survivor houses, but that doesn't mean they're common to find. What's weird about all three of these vests, though, is that no matter the rarity that they are, they all have the same protection value and weigh the same, but only different insulation and resistance to temperature. It's strange. I don't know why some of these vests will act like they have a lot more in them, which will make you a lot hotter and insulated, but others provide less insulation as if there's less protection within them, but there isn't after all. Oh wait, I almost forgot, you guys might not know what a survivor house is. While looting different houses, you have the chance of coming across a house that has been boarded up almost as if somebody tried to hunker down there. Now, spoiler alert, um... They're dead. Even though their house can be completely boarded up, there still will be zombies in there. But once you clear everything out, the loot within here is actually really good. You can find dozens of food, weapons, medicine, that civilian vest if you wanted that for some reason, and really everything that jumpstart your survival in Nox Country. And on top of everything, you already have a cleared out barricaded house, so it's best to take advantage of what you have here. Another thing that you can really take advantage of within Project Zomboid is drinking. No, yeah, trust me on this. Drinking any type of liquor can quench your hunger and your thirst, will get rid of unhappiness, and is all around the perfect thing to have before taking your keys and driving across the county of Knox Country. Anyways, after going sober, your character will not suffer any hangover whatsoever. Although there is a moodlet or that thingy right there related to being hungover within the game's files, to this day it hasn't been shown to the public in the Build 41 release, but has been released in the older stages of the game. I don't know how I feel about this moodlet if it gets added. I kind of want to be like the Burt Kreiser of Project Zomboid and drink my heart out without having any repercussions. And really, all I want in this game is to drunk drive. Now, being hungover is not the only thing that is missing within the game. Within Project Zomboid, there are a handful of traits that have been wiped from the game for whatever reason. Here is a list of what's been removed over the past builds in Zomboid. Short Tempered is a trait that'll give you 4 points to spend on in your character selector. This trait will make your character more likely to be angry, as well as the negative 4 trait being the patient will cause your character to be less angry. Now, being angry is something that I didn't even know existed in Project Zomboid, as it's not in the game currently, but upon looking at at the wiki, it seems that the moodlet affects how you talk to NPCs. The angrier you were, the fewer options you would have to interact with NPCs, and being furious could automatically cause NPCs to become hostile towards you. Brooding is another trait that deals with how your character feels. This trait would give you plus two points and would cause you to lose your negative moodlets far slower than normal. Now I feel like that trait was reasonably removed because you can just easily drink your problems away, and there were some traits that related to drinking as well. Light drinking would give you plus two points points and make you drunk five times faster, whereas hardened drinking would cause three points and would cause liquor to be less effective by around 30%. But seeing that hungover is not in the game anymore, there's really no use for the two traits at this point. Then you have the marksman trait that worked like the desensitized trait where you can't buy it but instead get it from choosing a certain profession like a police officer. Apparently this trait would cause you to have faster reloading and better aiming, but this trait was seen as way too overpowered and would be quickly taken away. Finally though, there is my absolute favorite remove trait, that being the hypochondriac trait. This trait would only give you two points, but every time you would receive a scratch, laceration, or really any damage, your character would have the chance of feeling sick, almost as if they were infected. But being able to tell the difference between being infected or being a fool's gold hypochondriac was near impossible. I feel like this trait would be incredibly fun to use to this day, as you don't know whether or not you are actually infected or not. So I am kind of sad that this was removed altogether. But hey, it is what it is and now we move on to the next tier of the iceberg wait is is that a scratch on me no 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 i'm gonna i'm gonna die <laughs> Like I said earlier in the game, Build 41 overhauled the sprites and animations within Project Zomboid. But do you want to see what everything looked like before this update? They look 
very weird to say the least. All the people in the zombies look so much more out of place and their animations look like they're walking on slippery ice. And the farther back we go, oh my god, the more pixelated these characters become. What's terrifying though is that when the zombies were knocked down to the ground, they were absolutely still, even if they were still alive. Imagine trying to play with a deaf character trait in build 40 and not knowing if the zombie is actually dead or not. I could never. During your time in Nox Country, you can tune into different radio stations to see how the world reacts to the virus. One of the most devastating stations in the game is the 93.2 LBMW station, which belongs to the headquarters outside of the exclusion zone in Louisville. During the start of the outbreak, you follow two reporters named Jackie and Frank, who spend their time by the exclusion zone where the military has first set up. In the first couple of days, you can hear how the military is trying to keep the zombies in, while also trying to calm the civilians who are still alive. Tensions are very quickly built up due to the military's treatment of the separating of families and putting down infected people. However, around day four, a little bit of trickiness happens in the exclusion zone. Frank and Jackie get separated with Frank being on the other side of the exclusion zone, so he gets eaten almost instantaneously. And around day eight of the outbreak, a full-scale riot breaks out between the civilians and the military due to the military putting down two unnamed civilians. And because of this riot, thousands of zombies come to the exclusion zone, break through, and the military does what they do best in every single zombie media whatsoever and fail miserably at containing the virus. Jackie locks herself in the radio room by herself, but after a few days, she succumbs to the infection, even though she hasn't been bitten by any zombies. This isn't the end of the horror at the radio station, as a few days later, when the zombies take control of Louisville with the military finally pulling out, a survivor camp reactivates the 93.2 station with a guy by the name of Jonas taking control of the mic. This does not last long though, as only after a few days, you can hear the zombies break into the radio station and seemingly kill the entire group. This station is absolutely devastating, and what's shocking enough is that this is not nearly a fraction of what you can hear on the radio or on the TV. Now, one comparison I made earlier in this video was between axes and crowbars. I feel like this debate between the two will never die out. But one weapon that some consider to be better than both the axe and the crowbar would be the spear, due to how easy it is to craft it and how easy it is to kill zombies with it. To craft a spear, you need either a branch or a wooden log, and then a knife of some sort to sharpen the wood. And there you go, you have your very own spear. If you really wanted to be crafty with the spear though, you can use duct tape to attach a knife to the spear, and boom, you have an even better spear. Now, although these weapons break fairly quickly, which is the biggest negative factor about this, the spear can easily take out zombies even if you haven't leveled up the skill before. And if you upgrade your maintenance skill, which affects your weapon's durability, you can get a very easy, long-lasting weapon. Now, getting the wood for the spear or any buildable object in Project Zomboid can be a little bit difficult. You can forge around to find any loose branches or logs to make a makeshift axe, but it's always more beneficial to find a fire axe or a wooden axe to chop down the trees. Even then, that can take a while to find. But one tool that is heavily requested and is even in the game's files is the chainsaw. This loud machine would need gas to operate, which would cause zombies to be attracted to you, but would chop down trees the most efficiently. And if you wanted to start an Ash Williams cosplay in Zomboid, then there you go. Although the chainsaw has been in the file since the build 41 update, the only way to obtain the item is by using the debug menu in the game. Hopefully though, this item gets added soon in the build 42 update, as the chainsaw in the game would be absolute kickass. Another few items that'll hopefully see the light of day in Zomboid are the military vehicles and fire trucks. While roaming Knox Country, the only real fire service vehicles you can find are some pickup trucks by accidents, house fires, or fire stations. Other than that, there's no actual fire truck to find, and with that, there is no sign of any military vehicles here. No jeeps, no trucks, no tanks, bro. What? It's a shame since this place is the start of the outbreak, you would expect there to be a lot of military presence even though they pulled out. Like even just seeing a broken down tank or a fire truck on the streets would be absolutely sick to see. And don't even get me started with being able to drive these tanks drunk. Oh my god, bro. That would be so... I think I have a problem.
One of the most useful things that you can use with the radio is tuning into the emergency broadcast system. This channel will automatically play every hour of every day, even when the power has shut off, and its use will tell the temperature outside, if there are any weather effects going on, and even when the blackout in Knox Country is about to happen. But one feature that is slept on with the broadcast system is that it will alert the player about the helicopter the day it spawns in. With the knowledge of how devastating the helicopter can really be, it's nice to know when it will come out so you don't have a horde placed on you. Before you spawn into the zombie riddled Kentucky, you can pick out your character and choose their specific positive and negative traits as well as their previous occupation. If you don't know how the trait selection works, basically you pick out positive greed points which will increase the price depending on how strong the trait is. To get points to spend on those positive traits, you then have to obtain negative traits to equal everything out before you can spawn in. A couple negative traits are more manageable than others, but one that's practically a freebie is the smoker trait. This trait, giving the player 4 points, will essentially make you addicted to cigarettes. Over time, if you don't smoke, you will become anxious, which will lead to agitation, and that will then cause you to be unhappy. Now, having anxiety will force you to lose weapon damage, and at the same time, unhappiness will cause you to act a bit slower. But being anxious doesn't actually affect the player, only agitation does, and everything past that. Additionally, your character won't suffer from the worst tier of panic, and really, if you just want to smoke once a day, your anxiety will be cured. Hell man, even if you don't feel like smoking at all with this trait, your character will be completely fine. Essentially, getting the smoker trait is just getting 4 free easy points. Now, while we're on the topic of smoking, apparently all of the dare programs that you did as a child that you thought didn't mean shit actually meant something. In Project Zomboid, cigarettes are the ultimate silent killer. Not even trees are as deadly as cigarettes. If you decide to smoke countless amounts of sticks in one sitting, your character will start to become queasy and eventually sick. But if you smoke to the point where you have a fever, your character will then die from poison and that's not the only way cigarettes can kill something. If you mix cigarettes with water inside of a gardening spray can, you can actually create insecticides that'll help your crops from getting eaten by various pests. So even if you don't smoke yourself, make sure you keep that Newports. Maybe your plants would want them instead. It's not concretely explained why or how this virus was able to spread in Knox Country. There have been many theories on how this infection started both in-game and throughout the community. One major conspiracy I explained earlier was how Rosewood seemingly involves the government in its secret military base, but there are other, more smaller theories relating to terrorism, the wrath of God, and even meteors from outer space. But one other major conspiracy that circulates around the internet occasionally is that the Spiffo fast food franchise is the cause of the outbreak. In total, there are 13 Spiffo restaurants within Knox Country, seven of which are outside the exclusion zone. This fast food joint is popular within this game, especially with their special burger that includes a sauce nobody knows the secret to. Some people suggest that the sauce is to blame for the outbreak, however, most other people believe that it's actually the meat that contains the virus. Spiffo's is one of America's most beloved food chains. Founded in Rayleigh, North Carolina in 1940 by brothers John and Kevin Spiffenmeister. Spiffo's restaurants today can be found as far afield as China and the former Soviet Union. And yet, the Spiffo's Corporation has a secret it just won't tell anyone. The key ingredient in each of its burgers, Spiffo's Special sauce. Just what exactly are the components of this sauce? If they're safe, then why keep the recipe a secret? And is there any truth to the rumor that the sauce has been changed? Just before the UK's BSE crisis began? Perhaps Spiffo's servers should be asking, do you want lies with that? People tend to believe that this is the case of a mad cow's disease, which is mutated and becoming something more deadly than it is in real life. One caller on the Knox Talk radio channel even had this to say. I show with Knox Talk, Catherine. That new Spiffo's restaurant just opened. And you think it's somehow connected? It's in the meat. They've been feeding cattle to cattle. It's a European thing. Do you think it's possibly related to the BSE crisis? Mad cow disease. There's a guy talking about it on Triple N. Guy wrote a book, said, it gets into your head. You eat burgers and it gets to your brain. My son worked in Spiffo's before they let him go. You know how many he cooked a day? A lot, a whole lot. That's all I'm saying. Huh. All right, well, we appreciate you for your call, Catherine. This isn't the only person to have this claim. During a late night show on the WBLN station, Professor Peter Enslay, wow, what a tongue twister, claims that this is the next step to Mad Cow's disease. With this and how many restaurants are in this county, as well as the fact that the franchise went international to many other countries in the world, which would be a great way to spread the virus initially, this theory becomes one of the more substantiated theories within Project Zomboid. Do I agree that this is the case? 
Probably not. As fun as this conspiracy theory sounds, it doesn't actually make sense how half of these restaurants could hold the virus, but not any of the other places in Louisville. It also makes no sense why exactly the Spiffo restaurant would start the outbreak other than an unintentional contamination, like in the movie Cooties, but still, even then, there's no evidence to back this claim after going to the Louisville headquarters. There's no talks of a botched recall or anything like that. I could be completely wrong about this though. As of right now, we know nothing about this Knox infection. One thing that we do know about this virus though, is that it has a tendency to mutate. When the outbreak first occurred, the only way to receive the infection was through a transfer of saliva or blood. However, around the eighth day when the exclusion zone was breached, it was documented that some people became infected without being in contact with a zombie. Jackie Jane is a perfect example of that. Because we are not the walking dead, dun dun Sorry. We know for sure that our characters are immune to this airborne virus. It's not clear how we became immune in the first place, or even if there are people who are immune to bites and scratches as well. But still, it's nice to know that there could be some way that a cure could be created in the future. Or maybe it's more worrisome that the virus can easily mutate as it did. Apart from the main channels that you can find on the radio, you could also tune in at specific frequencies and hear the stories of other survivors or military personnel out in the world. All of these hidden channels are going to be set at a random frequency, and will play at a set time, but even though it can be challenging to find these broadcasts, these stories that are in here are incredibly disturbing. For example, there's this one broadcast that occurs for a couple days at the Nashville Air Force Base. This broadcaster named Hal says that the base is fortified, has a lot of supplies, and will accept anybody who goes there for safety. He does mention that there is a growing amount of zombies outside of the base though, but that should not be a worry. However, after about six days of broadcasting, Hal will go silent, and after a few days, another person named Zack will be on the mic. He says that the zombies had overrun the old group, but then in another broadcast, he says that they've been drawn away, and that their new group came in to fix the fort after the zombies left. What's weird about Zack, though, is his desire for people. Although Hal was looking for people to come for refuge, it's clear he wanted that, Zack seems to have more of a sinister tone, with him saying that they just need the people, while also then calling them fresh blood. What's even more weird is that Hal mentions on the last day of broadcasting that their group was planning on raising the draw Bridge. So how could the zombies have overrun the base or left if they were able to? To me, it sounds like Zack's group forcibly took over the base and is bringing survivors over to their base to either rob them or eat them. Now, this broadcast is only one of dozens of hidden broadcasts that you can tune into on the radio. And after listening to a lot of these broadcasts, it makes you wonder about the true horrors of the world that's going on around you. Maybe you should be glad that you're isolated with nobody else in sight. <sighs> That was very dark. I think with the dark tones that this tear of the iceberg had, I feel like I want to end this off on sort of a funny tone. As if I'm kind of flushing away all of the horrors that have happened here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll actually stop with the puns. One Reddit post a few years ago on the Project Zomboid subreddit received some traction after a user found a bathroom with two toilets facing one another. Although it's not clear why this was here, one user, who I believe is correct, went on to say that this is the sport of competitive shitting that is fairly common over at Kentucky in real life. Sadly though, soon after this post went up, one of the toilets was removed from the bathroom. So, uh, so no more competitive shitting in Kentucky. I mean, it's not like zombies could do that in the first first place. Wait, do zombies need to shit? Like if a zombie eats like, like an orphan or something, what happens to the food? Huh. I'm gonna need more time to think about this, but for now, let's just go on to the final tier. Alright, so back to the really dark undertones of this game. After the riots of the exclusion zone, which caused the zombie breach, all of the news stations were quick to discuss the true horrors that the undead caused. One of these discussions was that of a picture showcasing a man around his 30s covered in blood and bite marks. It is said in gross specifics that this man was raising one of his arms, while the other one seems to have been bitten completely off. Even though these zombies are just a work of fiction, being able to picture what would actually be like to see this is truly horrifying to say the least. Going back to the traits that you can pick, I discussed how smoking can be seen as far more positive than anything else. But let's talk about the opposite and how a positive trait can seemingly be more negative. Speed Demon is the lowest costing positive trait at only one point and will cause you to drive your cars faster than normal. But because of how crashing in this game works and how if you basically bump your car into a tree and cause the most minor damage, you somehow explode into a million pieces, it's not very wise to get a trait that'll make you go faster in a car 
especially if you can lose control of it. On top of that, this trait will also cause your vehicle engine to be louder than normal, so if you do survive the crash, well, then hundreds of zombies will be coming towards you, and they will definitely put you down for good. One of the most popular Project Zomboid creators out there is Ambiguous Amphibian. He's been creating Project Zomboid content for over five years at this point, but one of his series that popped off both his channel and Zomboid itself was his Zero to Hero challenge. In this, his character Gerald Williams would survive the CDDA challenge, where he would start out with no items or clothes, be severely damaged, and be inside that burning house. After 16 parts, Amphibian would abruptly stop the series, with him not giving a concrete answer as to why on his channel. But on a Reddit post by Amphibian, it suggested that Gerald met his untimely demise, although it's not confirmed. Maybe he got tired of the series, maybe Gerald did die gruesomely. Who knows? During the mid-20th century, Kentucky was a state home to nuclear weapon testing in real life. Decades later, it was revealed in 2000 that there were allegedly thousands of nuclear weapons buried within Kentucky. In an interview with a lieutenant general on the WLBN station, you can also learn that there was at least a time where this part of Kentucky had government chemical testing. This is just a wild theory by the iceberg, but it would be interesting if there were some connection between nuclear testing and a mutation of the virus that could cause the dead to rise back up. With how little we know about the cause of the Knox Country infection, this could be the case. Another theory that could be true within Project Zomboid is that animals can become infected with the virus. There are a few callers within Knox Talk Radio that mention how their dog suddenly became sick. Some examples are the West Point bar owner, who says that his dog fell ill while on a road trip, as well as the mysterious janitor caller, who talked about that security dog guard becoming sick while working at the strange military base. With that as well, there's also a caller by the name of Carla, who explained how the military ran randomly shot her dog while she was trying to get off the streets of Louisville. Hi, right, folks. A lot of voices on our lines as you'd imagine. Goddamn, y'all need some jobs. But Danielle's got a story to tell. You've got the mic, Danielle. They're lying. They're lying to us. We were on the inside of my mom. She, she, she was attacked. This guy bit her. We tried to get out, but they took her. I don't know where she is. I took my dog out of the car and I just ran. They shot my dog! What kind of soldiers do that? Although it's highly unlikely that when animals are added to the game, they can become infected as if this was seven days to die, it would be cool if the virus could linger in the animal or cause it to die and just not reanimate. But that's just something to think of when Build 42 releases. Apart from the Spiffo fast food joint, another major food chain present in the Knox country is the Pizza World Pizza Place. Another tongue twister, say that five times fast. Pizza World Pizza, oh, I'm not doing that. This iceberg relates the pizza joint to the hit flash game Papa's pizzeria, and after looking at the two restaurants, I can kinda see it. I mean, both places share the red and green color scheme, both text fonts on their logo are bold and red, and their employees' uniform are the same red color. So if you want to relate the two, I wouldn't argue against it. So this topic I'm about to discuss is one of those blink and you'll miss it type of scenarios, but holy shit when you think about it, this is an incredibly important piece of information for Zomboid's lore. But do you all remember that one VHS tape about the loony alleging that the secret sauce at Spiffo's was the reason for an outbreak of some sort? Well, this outbreak is known in game as the Relay outbreak. Happening sometime soon before the Knox infection, this previous outbreak was also seen as a mutation of mad cow's disease. This virus itself, which has the nickname of the EVSM virus, began in the town of Relay, North Carolina, which strangely enough is the birthplace of the Spiffos restaurant in the 40s. Unlike the Knox event though, the EVSM virus could only be transmitted through livestock and any other animals, but if a person were to eat the infected animal, basically their entire entire nervous system would be painfully broken down into nothingness. This outbreak did cause mass panic and the CDC had to get involved, however it's been noticed in some of the shows and tapes that reference the outbreak that the military had little to no presence there, as well as the CDC tried to cover everything up by saying that this was only lethal to animals. Maybe the Spiffos chain was actually more involved in the zombie outbreak than I let on in the first place. I mean, it is next to confirm that they were responsible for the relay outbreak, but then again, why would the government try to act like nothing happened in this situation? Whew, we are at the final topic of this iceberg. Wow, it's been a pretty long video. I have to admit, thank you all so much for watching this at this point. Anyways, back to the video. Although the power can shut off anywhere between the first 30 days of the game, or 14 days depending on if you're playing single player or multiplayer, all TV and radio communications will be cut off on the ninth day. Before this happens, you will receive a final communication about the world's future from the overseeing general of the operation, John McGrew. Here is 
is the message. This is addressed to those unaffected by the second wave of the Knox infection. You might know who you are by now. If you don't, you will in the coming days. The disease will not spread to you as it has the others, but through fluid contact, by which I mean bites, it surely will. The time has come to bear arms against this threat. They may be your family. They may be your friends. Do not hesitate to pull the trigger. These are dark days, but as a nation, we can and will prevail. You have not been forgotten. We will come for you. General John McGrew, out. And with that, that's the end of humanity as we know it. All societies within this world met the same collapse due to this unknown lethal virus. You're one of the only survivors in a world full of mindless, flesh-eating monsters. It's up to you, and only you, to see if humanity will prevail as it's done before, or if it will finally die off for a new species to take over. But for now, all we know is that this is the end times. Thank you all so much for watching this iceberg video. If you guys like this and want to see more of this type of content, let me know. Hit that like button and subscribe as well as the Project Zomboid wiki for supplying all the information that I can gather. But yeah, making this type of video was so much fun to do. There was so much that I thought I knew about the game, but there was so much more new information that hooked me and made me want to include it into the iceberg. I had an absolute, no, no, not absolute. This video was a little bit too much. I might need a little bit of a break. But doing this was fun regardless. I do want to do more lore videos like this in the future, maybe do some future iceberg videos and other games. So hopefully if you guys like this, like I said hit that like button and subscribe but other than that i will see you all in another video bye for now i'm gonna go take a nap